Brown from Columbia Theological Seminary. And a little bit about Bill. He um, grew up here in Tucson and was a child of this church. I think he and I have known each other <laughs> most of our lives. Um, too. And Sheila and many people in this room. Um, he went to Whitman College and received his Bachelor's in Philosophy and then on to Princeton Seminary where he got his Master's of Divinity. And he was selected to go to Tübingen, Germany, and I can't pronounce it. You got it. Carl's yeah. University as a fellow exchange, exchange fellow for two years. Uh, then he served various ministries in the Atlanta area in Georgia, and then got his PhD in Old Testament at Emory University. And then was professor at, uh, of Old Testament at Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, and we overlooked at that in Richmond mm. by a year. Mm. So my second year, he was there for his first year. Then he, uh, after his time in Richmond, he moved to Atlanta to Columbia Theological Seminary and cur is currently the William Marcellus McPeter Old Test Professor of Old Testament. <laughs> yeah. And what he's probably most, well, unique, <laughs> can you put this on Facebook? I don't know. He is a member of the Association ah. American Association for the Advancement of Science. And I don't remember if it was you or a colleague of yours that said he's probably the only theologian that's a member of this society. <laughs> and he's written over 10 books and edited several others. We have a few of his in our library, and what we don't have in our library, we'll order them. So here's Dr. Bill Brown. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, I was going to mention that last fact is also the most important fact about my life uh, in the church. And in fact, I have a water bottle to prove it. Um, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the AAAS, uh, that was given to me when I first joined the AAAS several years ago. And in the back, it says, I am a force for science. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I, I'd like another water bottle that would say, I am a force for God's creation. So I'm still looking for that one. But uh, I may very well be the only biblical scholar who is a member of this scientific organization. And I attribute that to my upbringing uh, in part because now that I have you in suspense, <laughs> now let me get my There we go. OK. Uh, because I grew up here in Tucson, uh, outside of the city primarily, where I was privileged to see the dark, clear night skies and to see the Milky Way and the planets. And for several years, particularly when I was in high school, I fancied myself as a budding astronomer. Uh, it didn't quite work out that way, but uh, that, that gave me a love for science. And I grew up in a scientific household as well. As many of you know, my, my father, who was an elder here, uh, taught at the University of Arizona in the College of Agriculture. Um, and so I grew up with a passion for science. And after I sensed a call to uh, uh, biblical studies and ministry, uh, I felt for a while I had to table my interest in science and put that away on the back burner. But I realized more recently I can actually integrate the two. Uh, so some of my favorite biblical texts are the creation texts of the Bible, beginning with Genesis 1. And in fact, I was, uh, I was guilty as charged for focusing so much on the first chapter of Genesis, it took me several years to get beyond the first chapter of Genesis. <laughs> I even wrote my dissertation on the first chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1. But I have branched out, I'm happy to say, and uh, I've taken a particular fancy to the book of Job, which I want to share with you uh, this afternoon, almost afternoon. But first, let me say, what a delight and a joy to rejoin you here at Trinity. As Bonnie said, I grew up in this church, and I've, I've been here, I was here for many, many years, uh, from um, elementary school, junior high, high school, into my college years as well. And uh, I've always enjoyed returning and catching up with old friends, familiar faces, and meeting new ones as well. And a good sh great shout out to Lynn Mosier uh, and all of his 
musical talents that he has continued to exercise here. <laughs> All right, so Job it is. Uh, and so you're wondering probably, what does Job have to do with science? Well, that's why I'm here to tell you. Um, and I've entitled this, From Wound to Wonder, An Astrobiological Odyssey. Now, astrobiology is an emerging field within uh, the scientific guild that combines biology and planetary science and astronomy and astrophysics. It's an interdisciplinary field or a multidisciplinary field of science, alive and well, particularly now that the James Webb Telescope is up in orbit and uh, able to identify exoplanets, planets that are beyond our solar system. And not only that, but also to measure the composition of the atmospheres of these exoplanets as well, looking for what astrobiologists refer to as biosignatures, uh, looking for signs of life beyond our, beyond our um, uh, solar system. And there may be life within our solar system beyond this planet. We have yet to see that. Uh, but uh, I suspect there'll be some really fascinating discoveries within our lifetimes. Uh, so I call this an astrobiological odyssey because Job becomes privy to um, a cosmic revelation about creation direct from God. But before we get to that, a few things about the story. Um, and you know, most of you know the basic um, uh, let's go. Let's try this route. There we go. Okay. Um, thanks to William Blake, uh, a 19th century English poet and artist, uh, we have these riveting scenes of the story of Job um, through these about 22 different uh, paintings and etchings that he did over uh, his lifetime. So here's a picture of Job and his family. And they are prosperous, and it is a full family. Job is known for his great wealth. Um, how many sons and daughters? There are seven sons and three daughters. And the first two chapters of Job describe how affluent his family was until things begin to go awry. And uh, here we have this riveting scene, also from William Blake, of what is going on, if you will, upstairs, where God <laughs> enthroned in the heavens, surrounded by the B'nai Elohim, the, literally the sons of God, the children of God, the divine council. You may think of them as angels. But there's one particular member of the divine council who um, uh, engages God in a conversation, if you recall. Who is that? member of the Divine Council? Uh, not quite. It's not Satan with a capital S. It's, uh, it's the Satan. Uh, that term is a title in the Hebrew. It is not Satan with a capital S, the embodiment of all evil. We're not talking about the devil. Uh, the, uh, the development of the devil in, in um, Hebrew and Christian tradition came much later than what we have here when the book of Job was written. So we actually have this bona fide member of the divine council rising up to, get, to engage God in conversation. And he has a role to play within the divine assembly. Uh, the word Satan means literally the accuser. And his role is to roam about to and fro on the earth to cast suspicion on people, individuals who claim to be of perfect character. And who claims to be a perfect character in the book of Job? Job, that's right. In fact, God is the one who claims that. Uh, God says um, in, in boasting about Job, um, have you seen, let me get this right, <clears throat> um, ha have you seen, consider my servant Job, there is no one like him on earth. A blameless and upright man fears God and turns away from evil. And so Hasatan's response is, really? <laughs> 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 I 
do you really think that? Let's, let's, let's do a test on Job. Let's see how blameless he is if we take all of his possessions away. And so God, you have to admit, God does not look very well in these first two chapters of Job. God consents. Here we go. God consents to the Satan's test. And so here's William Blake depicting the Satan there wreaking havoc on Job's family, including the death of his seven sons and three daughters. Yeah. And so how does Job respond? Um, Job accepts it and continues to bless God. Um, naked I have come, and naked shall I go. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, so Job is depicted as the stoic, accepting character of the calamities that have beset him. He doesn't know that this is part of a divine wager up in heaven between God and Hasatan. And so the second scene, we return to God and the divine assembly upstairs in the second chapter. And what happens is that God says, OK, Hasatan, Job has passed the test. He remains blameless, and he, he fears God for nothing. That is, nothing will prevent Job from revering and worshiping God. And living up to his job description, Hasatan <laughs> says, really? <laughs> Let's try this. <laughs> and so in this case, uh, another test, perhaps a more horrific test, is executed in which Job is um, given a diseased condition, um, boils on his skin. In other words, Hasatan has touched Job's very body. And, and God consents to that. Again, as one of my students once said, it seems that God is quite the betting man. <laughs> And so the stakes are higher, but God says, just don't kill him. So Job does not die. He comes close to death. And so we have Job uh, with this skin ailment. He's now sitting on his ash heap. And um, new characters introduced in the second chapter. These are his so-called three friends. <laughs> and they come from the far east uh, in later tradition, they are actually kings uh, from different countries. And Job himself is a king as well, now suffering great calamity. And so they come and they lament. And so we have now Job on the left, uh, Job's wife. By the way, what is Job's wife's name? This is Job. I'm glad you asked that question because she does not have a name in the book of Job. Uh, but in a later tradition, a retelling of the story called the Testament of Job, written around the time of uh, Jesus, around the turn of the uh, common era, her name is Sidus. Sidus. And then her, his three friends here, um, Zophar, Bildad, and Eliphaz. Do you know who the shortest person in the Bible is? <laughs> Bildad, the Shuhite. All right. I do get paid for this. And I have to pinch myself knowing that uh, I do get paid for this. So his three friends, um, his wife, and Job. And um, uh, his wife, call her Sidus, um, has a few words to tell Job by way of advice. Do you recall what they are? Simple words. Curse God and die. <laughs> And um, uh, she prefaces that with these words, do you still persist in your integrity? Do you still hold tight to your integrity? Uh, if so, curse God and die. Now, that, those, those words of advice can be taken one of two ways, really. Job takes these words as negatively. He understands his wife's advice to uh, inviting him, demanding him to compromise his integrity to give up his, um, his stoic demeanor and to actually curse God. Um, 
But the wife could be meaning that this may actually be the fulfillment of Job's integrity. Job who has suffered so at the hands of God. Job who has experienced such deep calamity, the death of his children, the dispossession of all of his wealth, and, and now racked with bodily disease. If you are true to yourself, Job, if you are truly honest to God, if you, are truly, if you truly have integrity, then muster up the courage and curse God. So the wife's, wife's advice can be taken either of these two ways. It remains ambiguous. And so the rest of Job is all about what does it mean to have integrity in the face of calamity. Um, again, but Job takes his wife's advice negatively and says, why would you say that, oh foolish woman? And he goes on to casti cast, uh, castigate her while he continues to um, receive the good and the bad. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh, blessed be the name of God. All right. Well, things change in the third chapter. Here we have now a different dynamic at work that unfolds between particularly Job and his friends. Whereas back here, let's go here, they come and they do the best thing they ever did when they encounter Job for the first time on his ash heap. They sit in silence for seven days and seven nights. They don't open their mouths. They simply sit in solidarity with Job in this sort of state of silent lament. Those, that's what friends do. They stick with you through thick and thin. And sometimes they just need to sit with you and be silent uh, in, in this midst of suffering. But then, with their fingers pointed, <laughs> They accuse Job of all manner of evil. It all begins in chapter 3 when Job says these words. Let the day perish in which I was born, and the night that said a man-child is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, or light shine on it. Job begins a curse. He does not curse God. He actually curses himself, and specifically his birthday. In other words, he wished he had never been born. And he states that in such evocative language that it upsets his friends. And so it's, um, I think it's Bildad who begins, Eliphaz who begins then, Oh, Job, don't say such words. If one ventures a word with you, will you be offended? Who can keep from speaking? See, you have instructed many. You have strengthened the weak hands. Your words have supported those who are stumbling and have made firm the feeble knees. But now it has come to you. You are impatient. Interesting. What is Job most well known for in the Bible? Patience. His patience. And here, here, according to Bildad, Job is being very impatient. Well, Job can't wait to die. That's his only solution that he can figure out. Given the extent of his suffering, he wants to die. And so he expresses this death wish in the form of a self-curse. But when the friends begin to try to explain to Job his suffering by trying to identify what sin in the past he has committed, that would have warranted such great suffering on his part, Job decides he doesn't want to die. Rather, he wants to defend himself against his friends. Job knows he's innocent, or at least he's not committed anything that would have warranted such deep, severe calamity as he sits on his ash heap. And so for the next, oh my gosh, about 30 chapters, <laughs> Job and his friends go around and around and around, talking past each other, disagreeing, vehemently accusing each other of betrayal. Job condemns his friends for being betrayers of their friendship. Miserable comforters you are, he says at one point. In fact, 
the narrator back in chapter two says what Job, what, what the friends were called to do. They were called to come and comfort and console Job. That was their mission. And for seven days, they were doing it right. And then they opened their mouths <laughs> <laughs> and started trying to explain to Job his suffering. And that explanation led for them, logically, from some moralistic worldview that Job had to have committed something in the past to bring about such suffering that he's experiencing now. Job would have none of that, though, because he knows in his heart that he still persists in his integrity. His whole life was led in integrity. And so his solution, after condemning his friends, his solution is to accuse God. God has made a grave mistake. God has committed a divine blunder, a travesty of justice God has committed. That's the only way, oh, here we go again. That's the only way Job can figure it out. All right, we're back. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so this, this dialogue that began among friends turns into accusations and denunciations and anger. And yeah, the friends turn out to be frenemies in the eyes of Job. And in the eyes of his friends, Job is a blasphemer. How dare you accuse God of wrongdoing? How dare you accuse God of injustice? So around and around they go. They get nowhere in their dialogue for understanding, certainly not comfort. Job is not comforted by his friends. Job, Job's anger rises as his friend's anger rises as well. Um, I love, I think this may be my favorite uh, depiction done by William Blake because it so graphically captures the spirit of most of the book of Job. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And eventually the, the, the debate, the dialogues run themselves into the ground and they simply cannot talk to each other any longer. So, what happens next? Now, all the way to chapter 30, after they've been going round and around and around, uh, Job has this to say about himself. This is where Job reaches at the bottom. My inward parts are in turmoil and are never still. Days of affliction come to meet me. I go about in sunless gloom. I stand up in the assembly and cry for help. I am a brother of jackals and a companion of ostriches. My lyre is turned to mourning and my pipe to the voice of those who weep. I'm particularly intrigued with that line in verse 30. I'm a brother of jackals and a companion of ostriches. Um, this is one of the few times that animals are mentioned in the dialogue between Job and his friends. Why ostriches and jackals? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> These two animals are paired together elsewhere in prophetic poetry, like in Micah and in Isaiah. And they show up in contexts in which there's been urban devastation, where cities or towns have been destroyed by, say, an invading army. And the people are either destroyed or deported, and the city lies in ruins. So who comes first to start to repopulate the city? The animals of the wild, beginning with the jackals and the ostriches. And this is to say that for Job to invoke these two animals, he's saying that he feels that he is like a city besieged, a city in ruins. His life is in ruins. And at this point, um, at this point, Job has expressed the way in which he's been excommunicated, excommunicated by his community. He is alienated from his friends. Those who are left of his family have disowned him, and he's there isolated on his ash heap. 
and all he has left now are the ostriches and the jackals. They now have become his companions. And he doesn't mean that positively. <laughs> this is part of his lament. These are the most unwelcomed companions in the eyes of Job. The thing is, at least one of these animals is going to be mentioned again when God comes to Job to reveal this world that he has no understanding about. So in a way, this is sort of a, uh, a preview of what's going to come for Job. So Job laments before God. He accuses God of wrongdoing. And what now fuels his, his, his mission right now is that he wants God to show up, not in any place, but to show up in court. Job has essentially served a subpoena. God, Job calls God to court because Job wants an accounting from God. Job has accused God of wrongdoing. Now it's God's turn to respond in court. In fact, perhaps the most famous passage in Job in chapter 19, you may be familiar, I know that my Redeemer lives. Do you know that passage? When he refers to his Redeemer, Job is not referring to God. Because for Job, God is out to get him. He wants another divine member of the heavenly council to save him from God, to redeem him from God, to perhaps judge between him and God. And perhaps this is the deepest irony of the book of Job. Job hopes for a redeemer, a judge. It's not God, the God whom he thinks he understands, who has committed this grave mistake, this atrocity. And the only character we have been introduced as readers, a member of the Divine Council, is Hasatan, the Satan. Now again, Job has no idea what's going on up above him. He hopes for a redeemer. Hasatan is not going to be his redeemer. <laughs> He's the one who got him in this place in the first place. But it is a deep irony that uh, Job hopes for somebody other than God who has the power to save him from the hands of God who has gnashed Job in his teeth, in God's teeth. That's what Job says about God, that God has set him up for target practice. So, yeah, this is, this is Job lamenting, raising his hands to heaven, calling, among, calling upon God to give account of God's self. And God does show up, beginning in chapter 38, in the form of a whirlwind. And God speaks. Now, that whirlwind imagery for Job would have been a sign of terror. God does not show up as a warm and fuzzy friend. God does not show up as Job's advocate, not as Job's redeemer. But... God does show up. God shows up in creation. And this whirlwind image, the voice out of the whirlwind, uh, which um, God shows up in and says these words, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Oh, that's not very comforting. <laughs> God shows up to challenge Job, to challenge Job's understanding of the world and of God and of himself. And that whirlwind, for Job, that would have recalled the death of his children in chapter 2, because it was a great wind that blew and caused the house to collapse in which Job's children were, were making festival and they died by a great wind. And now God shows up in a great wind. Yeah, God shows up as a source of terror 
for Job. But then what follows is a lot of words from God. God does not blast Job away in the wind. But God does sort of blast Job with words, unending words that run um, in sort of this ricochet fashion, a barrage of words that uh, challenge Job. And even when God says to Job, gird up your loins and I will declare to you and you will answer me, God really doesn't give Job a chance to respond because God just keeps talking and talking and talking. <laughs> just like his friends. <clears throat> but what goes on here now is that through God's speech, which is cast in poetry, Job begins a journey, a journey on his ash heap. But it's like that ash heap has been turned into, if you will, a magic carpet that transports him into the farthest, farthest reaches of the cosmos. Yeah. And so God says, were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth, when the morning stars sang for joy? And then God introduces Job to the birthplace of light, to the heights and depths of creation, um, the, very, the very gates of the depths, and the extremities of creation as well. That is to say, Job, God takes Job on a journey of the cosmos. And through the power of divine poetry, Job is transported into these farthest reaches of creation. And so one of my favorite passages in Job, which may be one of yours as well, I'd like to read, talks about the desert. And in chapter 38, Verses 25 to 27, we read these words. Who has cut a channel for the torrents of rain and a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land where no one lives, on the desert which is empty of human life, to satisfy the waste and desolate land and to make the ground put forth grass? I don't know about you, but this is the first time I've seen the desert become so green mm -hmm. with grass, mm -hmm. with weeds. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a picture taken near where um, my childhood home is, north of Tucson. Um, and it's you know, because of these rains from the California storm systems that have come on about once a week now. And um, I've never seen this. I mean, I grew up here, and I've never seen it so green. Now, last year was a super wildflower bloom. Um, that was spectacular, too. Uh, but this is, this, is, this is strange for the desert. But uh, this passage from Job speaks to that, that God is concerned even with what Job considers to be a wasteland, a desolate land, emptied of human life. And God is basically saying to Job, well, there is life in the desert. And look. I'm watering the desert. It's greening. Not to mention all the wonderful creatures of the desert as well. So, yeah, the desert. So God points out to Job the desert. Job has no contact with the desert. And for him, the wilderness or the desert was a place of danger and chaos. And, and Job, you know, he's, he's a city kid. He uh, is an urban dweller. Uh, he lives... Um, in this uh, community in which he is the most affluent person. He fancies himself at one point as the king of a hill. Um, uh, and everybody looked up to him in his, uh, in his community. Well, what's interesting is that God then focuses on animals, what I call God's wild kingdom. But there's the lion and the raven and the mountain goat and the deer, the onager, which is translated also as the wild ass, the auroch, or the wild ox, the ostrich, there's our ostrich, warhorse, hawk, vulture, and then two mythological creatures, behemoth and leviathan. And uh, let me read a couple of things, focus on a couple of these creatures. Um, God begins with the lion. God talks about the lion. 
And this is what he says. This is what God says. Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their covert? Can you hunt prey for the lion? That is a question that Job would not have expected. When Job heard the words from God, gird up your loins and be like a man, which also could be translated as be a warrior, gird up your loins and be a warrior, um, Job would have expected from God the question, can you hunt and kill the lion? Just like any ancient Assyrian emperor of the day would pride himself in doing. Here's the famous um, wall relief from Nineveh. Uh, capital of Assyria, of Ashurbanipal, slain the lion. These ancient kings, whether in Mesopotamia or in Egypt, would pride themselves in their, their hunting prowess. They would stage these lion hunts. Lion, the lion, the king of beasts, being slaughtered by the king of the world, these um, ancient Near Eastern emperors. And so the lion hunt was meant to be a preparation for a military conquest. Uh, and so if the emperor could kill the lion, then the emperor could go out and kill and conquer countries right and left, which is what ancient empires did. So yeah, this is, this is more of the traditional depiction of the lion being slaughtered by, in this case, the king of Assyria. But God does not say, can you hunt and kill the lion? God says, can you provide for the lion? Can you hunt the prey for the lion, to provide for the lion? That very question turns Job's world upside down. God is about the business of caring for God's creatures. Even creatures that Job finds dangerous or repulsive as chaotic in the wilderness. And the same goes for the mountain goat. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the deer? Can you number the months that they fulfill? And do you know the time when they give birth? When they crouch to give birth to their offspring and are delivered of their young. Their young ones become strong. They grow up. They grow up in the open. And they go forth and do not return. Whereas Job saw the world and God as primarily a destroyer and, and a source of chaos for his own life, God says, no, I am the source of life and birth. And so God is replacing Job's word, words about how he sees the world as a place of chaos which is understandable given what he's had to face. But jo God replaces Job's view of the world with God's own view of the world, and God sees and works in these rhythms of life and birth and vitality. Can you provide for the lion? Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? And then there is the onager, or the, uh, the wild ass. Who has let the wild ass go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift ass to which I have given the step for its home, the salt land for its dwelling place? It scorns the tumult of the city. It does not hear the shouts of the driver. It ranges the mountains as its pasture, and it searches after every green thing. The onager sees the world very differently from how Job sees the world. Again, it scorns the tumult of the city. It does not hear the shouts of the driver. The onager looks at the city and sees only chaos and oppression, and perhaps laments over its domesticated cousin, the donkey, who is a beast of burden. But this is no beast of burden. This is a quintessentially wild and free creature. And when Job looks at the world, he looks at the wilderness and sees there a place of danger and chaos. And his comfort and his, his sustenance comes from being in community with other human beings in a village or in a city. 
And so these opposite worldviews clash in God's answer to Job. And what God is inviting Job to do is to look at the world through the eyes of the wild ass, to look at the wilderness as a place of fierce freedom and dignity for these creatures, and to look at his own place as a place of chaos. Yeah. So, oh, there's the ostrich. <laughs> Remember back in chapter 30, I have become a companion of ostriches. And this is what God says about the ostrich. The ostrich's wings flap wildly, though its pinions lack plumage. It leaves its egg to the earth and lets them be warmed by the ground, forgetting that a foot may crush them and that a wild animal may trample them. Um, it deals cruelly with its young as if they were not its own, though its labor should be in vain, yet it has no fear because God has made it forget wisdom and given it no share in understanding. But when it spreads its plumes aloft, it laughs at the horse and its rider. So I've always found it curious that God has this somewhat disparaging description of the ostrich. You and I know that the ostrich is smarter than the way God describes the ostrich. And I've come to the conclusion that the ostrich, on the one hand, is a majestic creature who is fearless. It laughs at the horse and its rider. That is, it laughs and stands its ground before the hunter. Because on the other hand, God says that it has no wisdom. Um, and I think there's a reason for that, despite the ostrich's intelligence. Um, and that is, God is saying, look at the ostrich, and then look at yourself. You are like the ostrich. You have been majestic. You have been powerful. But you really don't have any wisdom about how the world works and how I work. The ostrich is a mirror image of Job. And what God is saying is that, um, that Job, you've been a good man. And uh, later on, God will say, you didn't deserve this. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but you really don't have any wisdom about how the world really works, the world that is beyond your own little bubble. <coughs> Just like the ostrich has, um, has no wisdom. And so the disparaging description of the ostrich, I think, is there for a purpose to remind Job of who he is before God and before the cosmic stretch of creation. And then there's the vulture. Um, and God says basically that the vulture has its, also its positive role in creation. As you and I know, as denizens of the desert here in the Southwest, basically God says that the vulture is nature's vacuum cleaner. And uh, what God says is that wherever, wherever human beings shed blood on the battlefield, wherever the slain are, then the vultures will come to clean up the mess. It's not a very positive view about human beings, <laughs> but it's a very positive view about the vulture. And then finally, back to William Blake, uh, behemoth and leviathan, these two mythically monstrous creatures, God seems to have a lot of fun showing them off before God, <laughs> before Job. And this is what God says about behemoth. The whole behemoth which I created with you. It is the first of the great acts of God. The mountains yield food for it where all the wild animals play. Even if the river is turbulent, it is not frightened. It is confident though Jordan rushes against its mouth. Behold, behemoth, which I created with you. This is the first time that God lets Job know that he is connected to the wild specifically with this creature behemoth. Now, if, um, if you had to paint a picture of how behemoth is described, you may think of behemoth as sort of a larger-than-life hippopotamus. And some scholars have felt that behemoth is patterned off of a hippo. Uh, but um, uh, 
we have never discovered evidence of hippos in the Jordan River, for instance. Um, it's a mythical creature. Uh, and uh, it too, like all the animals, including the ostrich and the lion and these other wild creatures, they, they live without fear. Even if the river is turbulent, it is not frightened. It is confident, though, Jordan rushes against his mouth. I wonder, with this connection, I created Behemoth with you, that there's something connected between Job and Behemoth. That Behemoth's fierceness and fearlessness also reflects something about Job in the way he has fearlessly accused God and his friends of betrayal. I think God actually welcomes that. God welcomes Job's anger against God. Um, and it is, you know, I might say it takes audacity to call God to court, as Job has done. It takes, um, and this is more of a, not quite a biblical term, but it is a Yiddish term. It takes a lot of chutzpah <laughs> for Job to say what Job said against God and to demand from God an accounting. And it's like God is endorsing Job's working through his anger against God in fearlessness. In the eyes of his friends, Job is a blasphemer. Fearless blasphemer is Job. And Job, and God, and Job is reveling in that identity. And now God is saying, look at these wild creatures. They're fierce too. They are fearless as well. Yeah. And then there's Leviathan. Um, this is a great Bible trivia question. What animal in the Bible is a whole chapter devoted to? <laughs> Leviathan. This is what God says about Leviathan. Just some excerpts. No one is so fierce as to dare to stir it up. Who can stand before it? Who can strip off its outer garment? Who can penetrate its double coat of mail? Who can open the doors of its face? There is terror all around its teeth. No, on earth it has no equal, a creature without fear. It surveys everything that is lofty. It is king over all that are proud. God ends God's revelation to Job, God's answer to Job, with the character of Leviathan, this deep sea, underwater, monster, fire-breathing dragon. Um, artists over the centuries have run wild with imagination about what Leviathan looks like. Um, but uh, God says this about Leviathan in the final verse of God's answer. It has no equal, a creature without fear. It surveys everything that is lofty. It is king over all that are proud. That takes a stab at Job's own self-identity because Job at one point fancied himself as the king of his community, the king of the hill. And God tells Job, this is the real king on earth. It is a monster. It is a sea monster. And it too has a positive role to play. It surveys everything that is lofty. Everything that is lofty that includes human beings. Human beings who are so proud of themselves and see themselves as so powerful on this planet. Leviathan comes to remind them that they're just one creature among all the other creatures of the earth. That is Leviathan's kingly role in creation. Leviathan is a force of nature. Anything that puts us in our place is um, part of Leviathan's role in creation. That's how God ends God's answer to Job. <coughs> and yet, uh, that's not the end of the book. Because Job finally responds. And here are his final words. I spoke of things I did not understand, too 
things too wonderful for me to know. Therefore, I relent and am comforted over dust and ashes. Now, I'm here to tell you this is not the NRSV translation. It's not the King James. This is the, ah, um, uh, let's see. This is the NBV. You've heard of the NBV? The new brown version? <laughs> this is my own translation. But I think it's also correct. In fact, some of you may be aware of a, a more recent translation of the Bible called the Common English Bible or the CEB. It actually gets it correct. It, it uses the word comfort here. Whereas in the NRSV, it's therefore I despise myself and, uh, and I repent over dust and ashes. But actually the word means comfort. I mean, it could mean repent. But in the book of Job, this word, uh, um, Nacham in Hebrew, is used six times elsewhere in the book of Job. It always means to comfort. The friends come to comfort Job. Job condemns his friends as being miserable comforters. And now Job is saying, I have finally found comfort on my ash heap before God and before the vastness and wildness of creation. That, for me, is the biggest mystery of the book of Job. How does Job find comfort in all of this? How does Job find comfort when God has brought Job in contact with all of these wild creatures, not to mention giving him a cosmic trip throughout the universe? Job has found comfort in the end. Job is basically saying, where my friends and my community have failed me, you, O oh God, have succeeded. Even though, Job, even though God did not come as a warm and fuzzy friend. Um, God does not come as a solicitous deity before Job. God comes to challenge Job, but also to show Job the wonders of creation. Even those wonders that give Job a sense of terror, like Leviathan. God brings Job up close and personal to Leviathan under the water to show him the amazing things about Leviathan's power and fierceness. And Job comes out of that with a sense of comfort. Perhaps it's because he feels himself now connected, like Behemoth, which I made with you. Maybe he sees something of himself in each of these creatures, in their fearlessness, in their dignity, in their integrity. To push that hypothesis, as a scientist, no, I'm not a scientist, I'm the son of a scientist, but to push that as a hypothesis, I want to invite us at the end of this now to um, um, be a part of a um, audio-visual experiment or meditation. And what I've done is I've continued God's answer to Job by keeping Job underwater for a little longer. It is underwater that Job discovers Leviathan, God's favorite creature, perhaps. What else would God have shown Job perhaps in our contemporary, more scientifically informed context, what other creatures would have impressed upon Job a sense of wonder, a sense of terror, and a sense of comfort? So we'll see if this works. It is an experiment, and you are now my guinea pigs. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I'm going to play the voice of God and we'll see where this goes. All right, I was hoping for some music, but I don't think that's going to work. So I'm going to present to you, lacking the audio version, um, 
I'm going to show you the images and what I think God might say to Job uh, as these other creatures are introduced. Okay, behold, Job, the dark and watery depths, where my creatures, great and small, flourish in vitality. You call it chaos and death. I call it the womb of life. <laughs> Behold, Job, the bottom of the deep dark sea, where countless life forms oblivious to the sun flourish under great pressure and in superheated water. Among them are my delicate tube worms. And we're going to get to those worms after a few more introductions to these creatures. This is where the music would be playing. There they are. Among them are my delicate tube worms that extend up to 10 feet in length amid large colonies of bacteria. Humans classify these creatures as extremophiles because they live in conditions that humans themselves cannot withstand. But life began when Earth was ruled by extreme conditions. This was not Darwin's warm little pond back then. And you, Job, you're just a mere mesophile. <laughs> Job, behold the enigmatic Grampatathus. No, this is no anime cartoon character. <laughs> Humans call it the Dumbo octopus. It simply rests on the bottom with its mantle spread around it. And Job, do you know what it does there sitting so still in the dark? All right, then I'll let you in on a secret. It's meditating on Torah. <laughs> and this squid of mine, I'm going to let it shine. <laughs> it is equipped with a sophisticated lighting system of any creature, the most of any creature of the deep complete with filters, reflectors, and eyelids, all of which allow it to regulate the duration and intensity of its luminosity. It can even vanish into the darkness if it so chooses. And Job, I'm sorry, but all you've got are fragile receptors with blind spots. <laughs> and there it goes. Ah, yes, the Pacific viper fish with its long and pointy fangs that leave little chance of escape for its prey. Yet its teeth are so prominent that it has to put up with carrying them outside its mouth dangerously close to its eyes. And if it miscalculates the size of its prey and impales an animal that is too big, it may find itself unable to swallow it or to spit it out, condemned to die along with its last supper. But Job, my favorite creature of the deep, is the one that humans disparagingly call Vampiratus infernalis. <laughs> Too bad you don't know Latin, Job, for it means the vampire squid from hell. <laughs> it was so named because it frightened the living daylights of its first discoverers. But it is my mascot of the deep, half squid and half octopus dating back to 200 million years ago. And this creature can do something that no other creature can. It can dwell quite happily in the oxygen-depleted layer of the ocean. 
and it can do so by its special respiratory blood pigment. And being the slowest cephalopod of the sea, that helps as well. But Job, let's go back in time to say 300, 375 million years ago, a mere twinkle in my eye to another creature that humans call Tiktaalik rosé. It was recently discovered, its fossils were recently discovered in the river sediments in the Arctic Circle. Humans have na named it fishapod because it provides the missing link between fish and tetrapod, but I have a better name for it. I, God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I call this creature snout. <laughs> Its story has been told by one of my favorite writers next to Moses, Lauren Isley. <laughs> Snout's story begins as such things always begin, in the ooze of unnoticed swamps in the darkness of eclipsed moons. And it begins with a strangled gasping for air. On the oily surface of the pond from time to time, a snout thrust upward. It took in air with a queer grunting inspiration and swirled back to the bottom. The pond was doomed, the water was foul, and the oxygen almost gone. But the creature would not die. It could breathe air directly through a little accessory lung, and it could walk in all that weird and lifeless landscape. It was the only thing that could. It walked rarely and under protest, but that was not surprising, for this creature was a fish. In the passage of days, the pond became a puddle, but the snout survived. There was dew one dark night and a coolness in the empty stream bed. And when the sun rose the next morning, the pond was an empty place of cracked mud, but the snout did not lie there. It had gone. Downstream, there were other ponds, and it hobbled slowly along on the stumps of heavy fins. It was an uncanny business if there had been anyone there to see, except for myself. It was a journey best not observed in daylight. It was something that needed swamps and shadows and the touch of the night dew. It was a monstrous penetration of a forbidden element, air, but the snout kept its face from the light. Behold, Job, the snout. Even when the pond evaporates, it is not frightened. It remains confident that it can breathe above the surface of the waters. And do not mock its face, Job. Do not make fun of its face, for in 375 million years, that face would be your own. So come back to the surface, Job, and gird up your loins. Take a deep breath, for every breath you take is shared by all air-breathing life. Breathe, Job. Take in the breath of life and live anew, knowing that you have found kinship with the children of the wild and equally so with the children of Adam. And so Job, having beheld the beasts of the sea and the creatures of the primordial past, emerged slowly out of the watery depths. And he took a breath full and deep as if for the first time. And Job crawled back onto his ash heap, where he had suffered the insults of his friends and had once charged God with wrongdoing, bitterly awaiting his death. But now, amid the shocked silence of his friends, Job slowly lifted himself up, standing erect on his ash heap, and he prayed, not for himself, but for his friends who betrayed him. And then, 
And then Job walked back home, ready to begin his new life. So was Job's baptism into God's wild kingdom. Thank you for indulging me in this sort of mind, um, uh, this uh, thought experiment as to what God could have said more to Job while Job remained underwater with Leviathan. Um, Job has come out of this changed, transformed. And the last chapter of the book of Job really details how changed he is. He no longer is accusing God of wrongdoing. In fact, Job, God vindicates Job before his friends by saying, by accusing the friends of not speaking about God or to God correctly, as Job has. In other words, God says, I, I accept Job's anger against me. And because of that, I have shown him the universe and the glories and wonders of creation. And how Job comes out of that, he is no longer the sort of stoic, stereotypical patriarch that he was back in the first two chapters. He no longer has this sense of entitlement before God and his community. And he doesn't even act like a typical patriarch. Now, it is said that God blesses him with a new family, with the same amount of wealth, and some, some translations, a double amount of wealth. He has seven sons and three daughters, just like in the first two chapters. And, and just to um, address this issue, I don't think Job ever got over the death of his children. I think he carried that grief with him throughout the rest of his life, which makes his willingness to enter into this new life of blessing all the more remarkable, and to start a new family in the midst of such ter terrifying grief. So, seven sons and three daughters. And Job treats them now differently than he treated his first family, because it is said that Job shares his inheritance with his daughters. And in the ancient world, that did not happen. The inheritance of the paterfamilias went to the sons, and a double portion to the firstborn son. But Job is acting not like a typical patriarch. He is sharing his wealth with his three daughters. In the ancient world, in the biblical world, daughters had to marry outside the family in order to survive economically. Now his daughters are given the freedom not to do that. They can live independently if they so choose. God has, Job has given his daughters the freedom to live abundantly in a world that, in this ancient world of patriarchal norms. So Job becomes a different kind of family man. He extends his wealth to his daughters. You might say he is the first champion of gender justice in the Bible. <laughs> and it's because God has shown him a world that is run by grace and care for the creatures that humans find ambiguous, <laughs> but they are loved and cared for by God as well. And to put it briefly then, what God teaches Job is extreme biology 101, the <laughs> creatures of the wild. Job is not like Adam, in which the animals of the garden are brought to Adam to do what? Name. To name them. For Job, it's like through the power of divine poetry, he is transported into their habitats to learn about them and to learn their names. Job is sort of the anti-Adam 
or the counterpart to Adam. He now comes with a fresh view of the world, a fresh view of zoology and biology, and he lives accordingly as a fierce, free, and loving creature in God's wild kingdom. He is a wild patriarch. And it is said that he lived another 140 years, <laughs> full of days, full of life. And uh, the book of Job ends with asking you, dear reader, to imagine how Job lived the rest of his life, wild and free. Born to be wild. That's Job. And that's for all of us. So, science and Job. Yeah, for me, bringing in a bit of science, as I've lovingly described these creatures of the deep, uh, through the help of, um, of oceanographers and, um, um, and biologists, uh, for me, that deepens the message and impact of the book of Job. And for that, I say thanks be to God, and thanks be to science, thanks be to our scientists, and let the dialogue continue between faith and science. Thank you. Now, I just want to say that if the Wildcats were playing today, <laughs> this would not have been happening today. <laughs> But uh, you might still be able to catch the, uh, the championship game, uh, the end of it at least, uh, as we, as we uh, leave. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you around. Thank you.